You're listening to Talking to Teens, where we speak with leading experts from a variety of disciplines about the art and science of parenting teenagers. I'm your host, Andy Earl. So today we're here with Jim Davies, a professor of cognitive science. He is the author of the book Riveted, Why Jokes Make Us Laugh, Movies Make Us Cry, and Religion Makes Us Feel One with the Universe. He is a true Renaissance man when it comes to science and psychology, so we're really interested to crack open his brain here today and talk about his research in imagination and creativity and how you can encourage teenagers to be more creative, more imaginative, and take risks, even if it might lead to failures. Thanks so much for being here today. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, my book's called Riveted, and that's, uh, as of yet, my magnum opus of, of research, and that's my uh, theory of why we find things interesting. So the nature of art and religion and sports and conspiracy theories and why all those things are like candy for our mind and why we just eat them up like that. And I try to describe the underlying psychological reasons for anything being interesting at all. And my day-to-day -day research is uh, modeling human imagination with computer programs. So we try to make software that thinks the way people do and imagines visual scenes in the same way that people do imagine. And we end up with interesting questions, you know, like if I say imagine a scene with a mouse in it, you can do that and mm. most people can do that. But when we gave it to our software, what it ended up doing was it was picking a a couple of things from the animal mouse and a couple of things from the computer mouse. <laughs> so it had like a computer tower and a cat and it like, oh, no, doesn't make any sense. Some cheese. And and how does the mind know if I just say imagine a scene with a mouse in it? I didn't tell you which one it was. Yeah. And no one had ever really thought to ask. Well, how does the mind, does it first decide on what kind of mouse it is? One, right. Or does it, or does it come up with a big list of things that co-occur with mouse and find that they don't mutually co-occur mm. and swap them out until, like, this is the kind of thing that uh, you don't know what even questions to ask, right? right. So, so making the program forces you to get very detailed about the information processing going on in the underlying psychology. And I'm not saying everybody should be doing computer modeling, but it, that is its value. You know, we get sure. to... Uh, have to answer questions that other psychologists don't think of. So then what is it about some people, uh, someone like a, an Einstein or Steve Jobs or these people that we think of as being so able to kind of think outside the box? Is there something different about the way their brains do that process or are wired that allows them to maybe not just take the first four things that come up, but yeah. kind of make a, a leap you know, and connected to something that's a little novel or something like that. So there are a couple of ways to look at that. Um, creativity involves two kinds of thinking processes. They're called divergent and convergent thinking. So yeah. in divergent thinking, it is more of the idea generation phase. And then the other side is convergent thinking, where you restrain the ideas to what is feasible or appropriate or works well or optimized or something like that. And they're very different modes of thinking. And you'll find that people, and if you start looking for it, you'll see it in the people you work with. People are specialists in different different areas, Absolutely, right? Absolutely. Some yeah. people are just wild with ideas, but they can't ever nail it down to something useful. Other people are useless at coming up with new ideas, but they're perfectly happy picking on everyone else's and finding problems with every solution. Sure. And I think that, you know some of the greatest creative people are the people who can do both in different modes. Now, how do you get somebody to be like that? I think those are... Those are tools that people can pick up as they intellectually mature. But I will say that studying widely and reading widely really does help with this kind of thing. And you can look at the history of science. A lot of the greatest breakthroughs in scientific history have involved the merging of scientific fields that weren't previously yeah, related. Absolutely. Right. So Isaac Newton was the first person to think that the physics that determined where a ball went when you tossed it in the air was the same exact equation that predicted where the moon was around yeah, the Earth. I mean, that was mind-blowing. Yeah, because yeah. ballistics and astronomy before Newton were completely different fields. They didn't even talk to one another. Yeah. No one had the slightest idea that something as pedestrian as a ball being tossed in the air works the same way as the heavens, yeah. right? 
Now, oh, look at Einstein. Einstein worked in our patent office. That can't, yeah. you know, you know, <laughs> being all exposed, he does all day is look exposed at new ideas, you know. Ideas, so, huh? I, you know, I and I, uh, I'm a cognitive scientist. Cognitive science is an interdiscipline in itself. So we have linguists and philosophers and psychologists, computer sure. science, neuroscientists. And I find that very exciting because we all have different ways of looking at it. I'll, I'll talk about imagination just as an example. I'm writing a book on imagination now. My research field is imagination. If you talk to psychologists, what do they talk about? They talk about how can thinking about your life make you feel more depressed or less depressed? I'm a computer scientist. What are the computer scientists dealing with? Yeah. How do we make a machine that can create a visual scene for a video game? Right. You know, totally different. And then we got the philosophers who are concerned about Okay, if you imagine you can fly, how come that doesn't get used as a real belief? Uh, and I love the fact that I can look at things from different perspectives. So the fact that I do have three degrees in three different areas, I feel like gives me yeah. that kind of creative leverage that, you know, I haven't made any major scientific breakthroughs. Or maybe my book Riveted is a scientific uh, breakthrough. Yeah, history yeah, history yeah, will determine. Not so fast. You know, we'll see. But, um, yeah, that's that's another that's a long winded answer to this idea. Aside from just like this pure mm. divergent convergent thinking, which is a very low level way to look at creativity, sure. we also have different lenses you can learn. So, this idea of how do you raise kids who think for themselves? And I think every parent right wants to raise a kid who is you know, accepted by his peers and can find his place in the community, but also is a little bit of a leader and not just a follower. And I'm so fascinated by how you can encourage this kind of thinking in your kids. One sense of being a leader is that you aren't a mere follower and you will try new things. And this is a wonderful skill to have. It, it helps with innovation. It helps with all kinds of things. There's the other sense of leader, which is that you're leading other people. And I don't think we're talking about that right now. Yeah. And we're talking about independent thought, finding new ways of doing things. And part of the difficulty is that you want your kids to do it right. And when they do something, you probably know how to do it better. 90% of the time, and especially when they're very young, it's very easy to just say, no, that's not the way we do it. We do it this way. Uh, don't color outside the lines. Don't use the wrong colors. Uh, all the way up to, you know, don't set the table like that and everything else. Uh, and correcting people has its place, you know. But you need to be mindful that while you are correcting them and making them more competent, there can be a sacrifice in their willingness to try new things. Hmm. You know, I teach, I'm a professor and I teach writing and a lot of the students come in and their writing is really bad. Sure. And there are a lot of people out there who think that you should basically fill the page with red marks. But studies show that's really a dangerous thing to do because it makes them not like writing, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but, but because we tend to train students like this, we're ending up with people who can write perfectly crafted essays that are totally boring and meaningless. Right. But they're, they're you know, <laughs> they're spelled correctly, you know. And unoriginal. Yeah, unoriginal. Right, right. So... And I understand that it is kind of tricky, though, but when a child tries to do something new, praising that and rewarding the fact that they tried something new, even if it's not as good, is, I think, something that is really a great thing to do. Because someday they're going to come up with stuff that's actually useful and actually better. And for anybody in any new field, and kids are new in every field, right? But you get into a new field, your first while could be years your stuff is going to be really, really bad. And you need to, and that's the hard part is that's, you know, you know it's bad and you're doing bad things. You've got to keep going anyway until you get good enough that you're, you know, competing with the best. That's where that trade off happens, where it's almost like in the short term, it's faster to just tell them, no, here's how you do it. No, 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 no. That's not, that's not it. Do it this way. And, Maybe they get to a point of competence more quickly, but then it's almost like that teaches them that the answer is to just do it the way you're told or the way everyone else does it and right. not to experiment for yourself. I always think like in terms of cognitive behavioral therapy a lot where it's like, so we need to be able to notice as parents when we are doing that, when we're jumping in and like prescribing almost or correcting and what is an okay time to do that? And when do we want to not do that? And in the times that we maybe want to try to not do that 
what should we do instead? Yeah, I think it's really hard to answer in the abstract yeah. because you want to give feedback about how to be better. And you don't want to just like tell kids that they're just wonderful all the time, right? So that's also destructive. Yeah. Praising them on how hard they worked. I'm sure you're familiar with the research. Yeah. You know, you're supposed to praise like their behaviors and not their talents, right? And if, if a right. kid brings you every drawing they bring you, you're like, oh my God, this is a masterpiece. You know, eventually they're going to figure out that they're not making masterpieces. And, yeah. You know, they're, they're not going to trust you, but they also might feel like that their this special talent that they had is now gone, right? So I think it's a really, mm. uh, you got to weigh it for the child. And, you know, I'm saying child, but this really goes for anybody in your in your life that you're mentoring, if you're a boss or you're a teacher or anything like that. Sure. You need to know how much critical feedback to give. And some people, particularly early on in an endeavor, you need to be rewarded with what they've done, even though there's going to be a lot of things wrong with it. Yeah. And, you know, at the end, uh, you know, after some praise, you can say, you know, um, oh, you know, it might might be even better if you did this or, you know, next time you could do this. And just a little bit, you know, you don't want to hit everything wrong with it. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, a couple of things that they see might really help them. But, yeah, you got to be careful with it. I remember uh, somebody very close to me gave me a poem and she didn't write a lot of poetry at the time. And uh, I'd written more. And so I just got it in a Word document and I kind of rewrote the poem. Like I put on track changes and I uh, and then I sent it back to her and... I guess with the email preview, she only saw the final version. So she just saw what I sent back. And I think it really discouraged her. And she just felt like I rewrote her poem instead of, you know, giving her mm. ideas about, you know, what I liked about it. And maybe how she might think about making it better. Instead, I just made it something of my own. And, you know, I, I've never, I've tried to never do that again. And I think that uh -huh. was a, that's a way, that's a failure story, right? Sure. Of how you can discourage somebody from something by giving too much feedback. I saw an interview with Jessica Chastain, the actress, and she was she said something that's really stuck with me ever since I saw this interview, which is she was talking about an early mentor that she had at Juilliard who was like really an acting teacher who had like really shaped her as an artist. And she said that what a really good mentor does is they say, well, you have got something. And then they say, you know, you're going to have to work on this, this, and then your breathing is totally off. And then what kind of, what's your technique like there, right? And I feel like she kind of nailed it because it's like, you need to give them something to work towards, right? You you need to, like you're saying, not make them think, oh, great, good job. Yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful. But at the same time, you do need to also reward them for, yeah, you, you took a risk there and... It might not have been perfect, but wow, I really see what you did there. And that was cool. Right. Now let's talk about. An interesting facet of this that we also were kind of talking about earlier is the question of how much influence parents really have on some of this stuff and how much of it is related to the peer group. I mean, as social creatures, we are just so hardwired to want to fit in and i think there's a lot of research showing that in a lot of cases peers are maybe even more influential than parents even if you spend more time with parents right. because you just want to fit in so badly with the peer group so i don't know if there's a solution but it's interesting just to think about how can parents kind of maximize what little influence they have and recognizing this like strong innate desire to fit in yeah i think kids i think kids would hate it but it seems like the research points toward parents curating their kids friends and i don't want you hanging out with this kid because they're a bad influence yeah. you know like kids hate that but i mean what is your reading of the literature the same is like that's actually a big a yeah, big deal because uh, in the literature on like parent influence parents have an influence on the peer group that they're able to associate which which then in turn influences the student's behavior and, and let's talk about peers for a minute like we, when we say peers right now we're referring to other kids the child's age right yeah but psychologically speaking your peer group is the group that you identify with right and it doesn't need to be necessarily the people your own age uh, even your parents could be your peers if you were raised in a particular kind of environment right or if you're in a uh, you know, a hunter-gatherer group of 150 people, your peers are your everybody in that group, 
But yes, the reality is that in industrialized societies like we have, your peer group tends to be your classmates. Yeah, and the same sex classmates. Like when you put kids in that big of a group, they start to segregate. Mm -hmm. There's research on like what you were saying, hunter-gatherer societies. And in kind of tribal societies like that, there tends to be two large groups of children. There's like a younger kids group and an older kids group. Mm. And so the kids kind of kind of graduate or they move up their ranks until they're one of the oldest kids in the younger kids group. And then they graduate and they move up to the older kids group. Right. And then once they graduate from the older kids group, they're an adult. I mean, that's like, that's the way that we are naturally in right. kind of like the the group size that we evolved in. But we now have created this culture where we take such a huge group of kids and throw them all together and segregated by year, by class. And, oh, there's 35 kids. They're all going to be in one room and they're all exactly the same age. And it changes the way that the social dynamics occur, I think. Yes. So I think as a parent, like we were saying earlier, you do want your kid to be able to find their place in that group and to be accepted as a member of the group. Uh, I love this theory of optimal distinctiveness where it's like as humans, we adjust the way we present ourselves based on whatever group we find ourselves in mm-hmm. to to show that we're similar to everybody else, but we're also a little bit different. Is, it, is that a cross-cultural finding? Oh, I don't know about that. Yeah, definitely in Western cultures, individualism is big. We want to show that we're our own person, but still, we also want to fit in. With the yeah, group. yeah. Like today, we have just amplified this with social media and all of these online tools that kind of amplify our instinct to fit in and be a member of a group and to be really conscious of the way we're presenting ourselves. Right. So we definitely want to fit in, but we also want to distinguish ourselves. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, I think that there's there's limited influence you can have without causing undue resentment. But uh, yeah. you know, certainly, I think when they're younger, that you can put them in programs like camps or classes or whatever that are around students who are interested in things that are good for them, right? You know, even the extreme of moving to a city at a different school district to reset the friend thing or maybe to a better place. You know, if your kid's in trouble, that might be the most effective thing you could possibly do. People are talking a lot about helicopter parenting and bulldozer parenting But I feel like also it's not necessarily that we solve all of our kids' problems, but just that preemptively, if we can see that they're headed in the wrong direction, we shift them to try to shift them to a better direction to save them from having to go through that. And also to save the time because, hey, look, we got to get you ready for college and... Right, and this brings up the problem of grit and, and this idea that if we're never letting our kids fail, they don't learn how to deal with it. Yeah. This idea of grit is, is kind of like the bulldoggedness with which you approach life and its problems. I, I think it's a better predictor of success than IQ, right? Yeah. It's a really a big deal. And how do I put it? Like this whole idea of never failing is where everybody's a winner, I think, is something that came into the school system a lot in the, uh, after I graduated. I graduated high school in 89, I think. And I think after that, there was a big movement of this. The positive thinking movement really affected things. And we wanted kids yeah. to have self-esteem and stuff. Yeah, and yeah. I think there's a big cost to their persistence and resilience that has resulted. Yeah, sure. We feel the need to give people like participation awards now. And everyone gets the same size trophy just because you you did it. Good job. Mm-hmm. It seems like it's okay to encourage them to try things that they're maybe not going to be that good at. And then the trick is being able to push them in those directions, but then it's like the divergent convergent thing almost like at first we need to be able to say hey yeah try it but then like at a certain point do we need to come back and revisit it and say so how's it going or you know what i mean Get yeah that. and and i think that something that parent that everybody in our culture should strive to do is to become more tolerant to faults and failures at all you know mm-hmm. so teaching your kids is one thing but if you don't have the right mindset it's going to be very hard and and one thing that we kind of know intellectually, but it's very hard to live by, is that if you aren't failing a lot of the time, you're not trying hard enough stuff. You know, the people who succeed all the time are probably playing it very safe. And credit to this 
well, particularly American culture, I think Americans are particularly, they're better at this than almost anybody on earth. Like they're more tolerant of failure. Uh, for example, if you, if you have a failed business, you're more likely to get funded the next time. Like, because they think, oh, this person knows something. They learned something. And, you know, they're due. in China, <laughs> you not only are untouchable, but you've shamed the entire history of your family line. So you can see why in a culture like that, you play it very safe because yeah. the failure is such a major stigma. It's less of a stigma here. But I think it could be even less of a stigma, right? Yeah. So if you um, – I keep going to the arts. But like, you know, have a kid trying to play music. If they just play the stuff that they're good at all the time, uh-huh. that's guaranteed success, right? right. But you know, if, they, if they never push themselves to the point where they are failing, that's where the learning really happens. Yeah. And if praising people for failure is a very counterintuitive thing. Right. But if they tried hard and they failed, that is a sign that they are working at capacity. Yeah. They're right in their zone of proximal development. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Zone of proximal development. Yeah. And there's a quote by a Nobel Prize winning economist, I think it's George Stigler, that I love that seems like it sums up exactly what you're saying, which is, if you never missed a plane, then you're spending too much time in airports. (laughs) I mean, I feel like it's the same sort of thing. I mean, it's like if you never fail, if you're playing it so safe in everything that you do that you're not failing and you're not getting in trouble and you're not going down dead ends sometimes, then you might be playing it too safe. Yeah. And so helping your teenagers find that balance and as a parent, being able to kind of reframe failures as this is a good thing. And my teenager is actually maybe right on track. They're finding that balance. Yes. And then to be able to communicate that to them, saying, hey, you know, I'm really proud of you. I know that took a lot of courage. I think that's a fascinating conversation. It seems like we should wrap it up here. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Talking to Teens podcast. If you have any questions or just want to connect, you can always reach me by email, Andy at TalkingToTeens.com. We'll see you next time.